microphone. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Cool to see that that many people found their way to the dungeon that is room five. I had not been up here before. I ended up on floor three, and then two, and then four, and then had to walk to basically Scotland to get here. Um, anyhow, so uh, I'm going to talk about patterns um, in, in .NET, or software patterns in general, but I'll be using C Sharp and .NET to show, show some samples. Uh, if you're not here to listen about patterns, you're probably in the wrong room. Um, it's early, I know, but hopefully you're all here to listen to this. Um, so my name is Chris Klug. Um, I, I work as a software developer slash architect slash public speaker. So I have a, a weird employment situation where a, a, a substantial part of my life is spent going to conferences and talking about different things uh, I feel interesting to talk about. Um, my boss thinks that's a really crap idea, but his boss uh, thinks that is a really good idea for my company to go around and share knowledge. So he trumps my boss. Um, yeah, um, I've done some plural stuff and things like that, but nothing on patterns. Patterns is kind of a new thing for me to go around to talk about. It's actually my first time ever doing this presentation, so hopefully it. I don't go too much over. I, I assume if I just use up about 15 minutes of your break after the session, that's fine, right? OK, very good. Um, so what are software patterns? I thought before we get started, uh, we're going to have a little look at what software patterns are. Uh, and basically, I went to Wikipedia to figure out what that was. You know, you send in an abstract for a conference, and then when you get the talk, you go to Wikipedia, and you figure out what you're going to talk about. That's how I do my talks. And it says that it's a software, a software design pattern is a general reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem within a given context in software design. Makes sense, right? Interesting part here, out of all of that, that was also part of a, a whole page. Uh, but I took that out because I thought that was the best part of it. And then I was like, OK, so it's a general reusable solution, which is what everybody gets stuck on. That's, Software patterns are awesome because we can reuse them, and they're general, and we can do everything with them. But they generally miss the little part that says, within a given context. We don't go ahead and find a software pattern we like, and then try and find a problem we can solve with it, OK? It's the other way around. We have software patterns because you are probably running into problems while doing your job that other developers have run into previously. Likely, you're running into problems every day that developers have been running into since the beginning of coding in general. So we're looking at really old things. Um, if you start looking, up at, looking at software patterns, uh, if you Google that, it's interesting because you're always just going to find, I think it's 24 patterns. It's the gold standard. There are 24 patterns. No one else really counts. And that's because there was a book released, like The Gang of Four, that covered 24 design patterns. I'm going to show you some of those, but I'm also going to look at some other ones. But the interesting thing about those design patterns, which are pretty much the, the well-known ones that most people have heard of at some point, the book was released in, I think, 1994. So we're talking about really old things here, but they're still kind of valid to what we're doing today. We can make some changes to them. We can update them. We can bring them in to the 21st century because we've got new features in, in our code. We can do things in C Sharp that wasn't possible to do with code in 94. So we can, we can update them. And I have done that to some of the demos. I've, I've written my own version of them and not a proper copy of what they decided on. So. It is not a solution to everything. Keep that in mind. Um, it's a specific thing and not something where you go, this thing, I've now learned the visitor pattern that is going to solve every problem I've ever had. It doesn't work like that. So I'm going to look at some, some patterns. And when I got this talk, or rather when I came up with this talk, I decided that, oh, I'm going to cover a bunch of different patterns in an hour. I'm just going to go through like 100 different patterns and show why they're really cool. And then I realized I've got an hour. And if you want to spend a little bit of time on every pattern, you can't really do 100 patterns in an hour. It would be really, really brief and really boring. Um, so I had to scale it down. Um, and I, um, I've scaled it down to the bare minimum. 
There is source code available after the, the session uh, on, uh, on GitHub. I just uploaded it about seven minutes ago, so you can go and find it. It will contain other things than what I'm talking about. It contains all the code you'll see, but it will also contain some other patterns because I decided I'm going to do all of these really cool patterns and then they kind of got killed off while doing the presentation. So you'll get a bit more source code. But I did decide that I want to go and look at some patterns that are kind of confusing. I want to look at some really cool patterns. There is, in particular, one pattern that is very, very well used all over the world and is very misunderstood that I want to cover. <laughs> And there are a couple of little useful ones as well. It's like little nuggets that aren't really that impressive. They're pretty simple, but they do make your life a little bit easier, which is kind of what you want to do with patterns. So I've got them grouped into this. And as I said, I've kept them as small as I can, or the, the numbers as low as I can. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, if you go and look at the original design patterns, they're often really old. Most of the patterns are old. How many of you were even building software professionally in 1994? There's one hand. So just imagine that these patterns on top of that, they weren't conceived in 1994. They were conceived earlier than that. So I was barely a teenager by the time that they wrote those patterns. But they're still interesting. But as I said, Code has changed. C Sharp is much more modern and has a bunch of features that they don't have. So it's often based around base classes and inheritance. And I've decided not to use a bunch of base classes and inheritance because I personally don't like inheritance. I, I, I prefer um, composition over inheritance. So basically, uh, my samples are a little bit different. The first patterns I want to cover are a group of patterns, and that's why I put them into the confusing group. Can anybody explain to me the difference between these five patterns? Not a single person. Might be why you're in the room listening to me talk about patterns, but OK. How many of you have heard of all these five patterns? OK, so most of you have heard about all the five patterns, but none of you would say that you can explain what they are. And actually, you are probably using every single one of these, or have done at some point. But they are sort of lumped together, and they're really hard to get a grasp on which one is a decorator and what is an adapter, and, and what's the difference between an adapter and the facade and things like that. So I thought, I'll start out here, and I'll start out with the adapter pattern, so we can see what that is. And then I'll basically go through each one of them, and you can see the differences. Once again, I went to Wikipedia. The, the source of all knowledge in the world, Wikipedia, says, the adapter pattern is a software design pattern that allows the interface of an existing class to be used as another interface. OK. So what is the problem we're trying to solve? Well, say that you have a class that, well, rather you have an interface. I've, I've turned it around. But I would say you have an implementation that you want to use, but the interface for that implementation is wrong. So you, you want to write a logger. So you're writing an ASP.NET Core application. You need your logger to implement the iLogger interface for that to work, right? But you want to use some logger that you've written before. You want to log, use log for net or whatever. So what you create is an adapter. You create a class that internally has an instance of the implementation that you want to use, but externally has an API or an interface that looks like the interface that you want to use. So all it's doing is basically adapting calls. So when the iLogger.warn is called, or whatever the interface is, you might just have a, a simple one-liner that goes log for net dot log and then passing in warn as, a, as a, an enum instead, because that's the interface that they are using instead. So it's basically just a wrapper class that doesn't make any changes at all. It doesn't change the functionality. It doesn't do anything. All it does is mapping an interface that you need to an implementation that has the wrong API or the wrong interface. So if you look at this, basically, you have an in, an, a client app that needs an iLogger, calls log on the iLogger interface. Actual implementation is the log for net adapter. The log for net adapter internally has an instance of some form of log for net logger thingy and adapts the log message method from the iLogger interface to 
an info call on the log4net instance instead. So it's just adapting calls. Very, very thin, very simple class. I assume that most of you have written this at some point. OK. Which then takes us to the decorator. The decorator is interesting because it's very, very similar. And that's, where people, that's why I've grouped them together, because they kind of do the same thing. They're all code-wise kind of similar. So the decorator says the decorator pattern allows, allows behavior to be added to an individual object dynamically. So the description of what the pattern does is very, very different. But the actual implementation looks very similar, which is why people get tripped up. When you sit there and you're coding it, you go, oh, this is an adapter. No, nope, it's actually a decorator. So the problem that we're trying to solve with the decorator is that you have an implementation of something that does most of what you need. And you want to use that. You don't want to rewrite that because you need to add some new functionality. So you need what you've got and then some more. You need to decorate your existing class with more functionality. An example would be, um, I've used it for caching, for example. So you have a caching decorator. The caching decorator has the same interface as my whatever repository or whatever I'm using. But internally, it has an instance of the thing that I want to use. So say that I want to do, let's ignore caching. Let's do batching. I want to batch my log writes. So I want to be able to just pump things into my log, log system, but I want to batch my log, logging. So basically, it just writes every 10 messages or whatever, so it doesn't become too chatty to the database. I already have my log implementation that logs to the database. What I do is I create a, a log adapter, or sorry, a decorator, which is like the batching log decorator. It has the batching logic. It looks like an iLogger. And all it does, it has the batching logic, but whenever it needs to write the stuff to the database, it has an instance of iLogger internally. So basically, it wraps an instance of iLogger, but adds some functionality on top of it. So it's the same API, but adds functionality to it. And then you can wrap many of them. So you can have a decorator that references an iLogger, which actually is another decorator that references another iLogger, which could be another decorator that references another iLogger. And you can create these chains of objects without inheritance, which means that I can have an iLogger, and then I can add, oh, it would be cool to have batching in this project, so I'm going to add batching to it. Oh, by the way, it would be kind of cool if I could add environment information to the log system automatically, so I didn't have to pass in environment information all the time. I'll have an environment uh, or decorator that does that for me. And we can just kind of build these layers on top of what we've got with new functionality. So if we look at the, the logger implementation here, once again, client app has an iLogger, calls log on the iLogger. But what it's actually got as the implementation is a batch decorator. The batch decorator wraps an instance of log for net logger, but it doesn't wrap it doesn't say inside of the batch decorator new log for net logger because in that case we're talking about an adapter. The decorator has an internal instance of iLogger. So it's agnostic to what's, what it's actually wrapping. It's wrapping an abstract thing, which means that this thing will write out the log thing to log for net, but the batch decorator will make sure that it only makes those calls every X amount of time or every. It, it, X amount of log entries or something like that. And then you can go ahead and you can basically decorate your batch decorator with an env info decorator in this case that adds environment information, same sample as I had before. Client app is none the wiser, it just goes, I have an iLogger, that works. The environment info decorator has no idea what's actually happening underneath, I just got an iInfo, or an, uh, sorry, iLogger. And we can build, as I said, these chains of, of functionality to it. Very common scenarios, as I said, would be, for example, caching. You have a, a repository where you can go and get data, and that has no caching built in because that's not its concern. And then you add a decorator on top of your repository that has caching built in so that you get a cache layer on top of it, which is kind of neat because it means that you can add and remove the caches you feel like. So it's a wrapping thing, just like the adapter, but instead of just adapting from one API, one interface to another, it has the same interface as the thing it wraps, but it adds functionality on top of it. Make sense? Anyone ever try it? Very few. It's actually quite a neat pattern. It's very simple, but it does 
offer a lot of flexibility. And facade. Another one of these kind of does the same thing, but not at all. Definition of a facade is an object that serves as a front-facing interface masking more complex underlying or structural code. Okay. This is actually quite a neat thing. Once again, there, the patterns I've chosen are things I like because they make my life easier. So the problem that we're facing in this case is that you're interfacing with a system that is really complex. It needs you to know a whole bunch of how that system works and it's really complex. And to be perfectly honest, I've been on a, a ton of projects where we're interfacing towards a third party system which is really complicated and there's like one developer on the team that has all the knowledge of how to talk to that system and we can't really get that throughout the team. So what you do is you put in a facade. You let that developer who knows how that system works put in what is called a facade. So the facade solves this by simplifying the API. Say that you have a car. Car has all of these things. To be able to start the car, you actually need to insert the key and you have to press the clutch and you have to turn the key, right? We'll do that simply, but it was the simplest example I could come up with. Instead of having to, to figure out that to be able to use this car thingy, I'm going to have to call insert key, press clutch, turn key. What I want to do is start, right? So it would be much nicer if I could just do start. So you put in a facade that basically has the method start. And then that makes sure to handle all of the complexities underneath. This is a very simple sample, but there could be way more complicated things. There could be default values that you might want to fill in or several calls that needs to be made to different systems to get something to work. But in the end, the facade will basically take this big complex system with all of its intricate details and simple down to an interface that you know how to use. It often, very, very often means that you take a very big complex system that can do a ton of things and you basically cut off all of the features. You go and say, we don't need fe features A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but this little feature over here, that would be kind of cool to have. So we'll do a facade, cuts off all the other things, gives the user the ability to use this little part of the system. So we don't have to get this big thing. Anybody use a facade? Look at that. Most of you have used these patterns. Nobody wanted to explain them. Um, proxy. Proxy, pretty similar again. So a proxy is a wrapper or an agent object that is being called by the client to access the real serving object. Once again, it's a kind of a thing that you build to be able to hide something else or wrap something else or basically make something disappear for you. So what the proxy does is basically you have a system, part of your system that you need to talk to, but it's not part of your process, for example. It's not part of your system. It's something running somewhere else, potentially. But you need to call it as if it was a part of your program. You've all done this. How many of you have ever called a, uh, a web service? All of you who do not raise your hands, what do you do for a living? Because <laughs> I thought that was kind of ubiquitous. We all do web services, just as the way it works. It used to be um, WCF, and now it's all REST. But it's kind of the same thing. And what we do with these services that we need to call is we create a client object, right? We create a version of that object that runs inside of our program so that when we call a method on that object, it's just as if we are calling that object. The only difference is that when we're calling that object, it actually sends off the thing and calls that somewhere else. And in most cases, when it comes to web services, they're probably on a different machine. Um, anybody try... Uh, um, what was that? .NET had a rem remoting thing that was really cool that did the same thing for you, but you could call objects in other processes. I forgot the name right now. Um, there are lots of these around. Um, how many went to uh, Damien Edwards and David Fowler's talk yesterday about .NET Core 2.2? You remember that they said that they were going to add the ability to right-click and add reference to a, a, a Swagger file? Or a, yeah. That is creating basically a proxy object for you. It's just that you don't have to do it yourself. So you just say, my service is over there. Here's a, here's a definition of my service, just as Whistle was for a WCF. And it generates code for you for an object that looks like you're calling it locally, but it's actually being called somewhere else. 
It can be other things. I want to mention that. It doesn't necessarily need to be crossing the internet or things like that, but it's a way for you to call objects that are not locally local to your application. So the client sees an iSwitch in this case. The iSwitch is implemented by the switch proxy, and it calls just toggle, and it doesn't actually know what's happening. It just assumes that I'm calling some piece of code, but in the real world, it's actually going across my weird network at home maybe and turning on the lights in the ceiling. It's really weird that we are literally turning on lights wirelessly now, but that's the way it works. So proxies are kind of useful. And then the last one, which is the odd one out. It doesn't quite fit in here, but it kind of does fit in here. Does anybody know what a bridge is? Not a single person. OK. The bridge pattern is interesting, and you've all done it. I promise you. You have all done this at some point. The bridge pattern, blah, 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 is meant to decouple an abstraction from its implementation so that the two can vary independently. Did that make you smarter? Did, you, that, that, did that make you understand what the bridge is? No? Because that's the thing. I keep, I keep going to places on the internet, and I read about software development, and I read stuff like that, and I go, I have no idea what that meant. And I'm like thinking, I must be the only one. I must be the only one that reads this and don't get it at all, because it's still being written like this. But apparently, I'm not alone, at least. So. Say that you have an abstraction that basically is dependent on two different dimensions. So you've got two things that will vary your abstraction, which might end up being a lot of different implementations. So for example, oh yeah. <laughs> eh? Say that you have a shape renderer. It renders shapes, the Implementation of that is default and high contrast. So I have two different versions of that. So I want to be able to render my shapes in the default version, but I also want to be able to have logic in there to do high contrast for people with poor eyesight. But then that implementation also needs to support both WinForms and WPF, right? So I've got two different axes. I've got the default versus high contrast, and I've got the platform that I'm running on, which is WinForms and WPF. So I end up having to do four classes here, right? I need to do the default WinForms, default WPF, high contrast WinForm, high contrast WPF. We can all agree on that, right? And then your boss comes and says, hey, Grayscale would be cool. Damn it. OK, so I need to create Grayscale WinForms, Grayscale WPFs. Now we're up to six different implementations that we have to choose from. And then somebody comes and says, hey, dude, Xamarin is kind of cool. Oh, so we end up having to do a Xamarin version of each one of these. So with just three options in each axis, you end up with nine different implementations. Does that seem like a, a useful solution? It's going to end up with just blowing up and having many, 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 many implementations and you having to figure out which one to use. So what the bridge pattern says is, let's split it. Let's split the two axes into two different things and basically say, we'll have an eye shape renderer, which is implemented by the default and the high contrast thing. That implementation is in turn dependent on an eye renderer, which can then be WinForms and WPF. So I can just go ahead and implement these things. So the default, deep default eye shape renderer takes an instance of eye renderer to do the actual rendering. So it does a part of its logic about what it needs to do, and then calls the renderer to do the actual rendering. And the high contrast one will basically change the colors of the shape and then send the shape to the renderer to do the actual rendering. So we end up having to do less code. And if we then go ahead and we add high contrast or grayscale and WPF, we just add on each layer, we add a new implementation and we combine them. So we kind of end up, or kind of, we end up with a double abstraction. So you get one thing that abstracts the whole thing, but that abstraction in turn takes a dependency on another abstraction to do some of its work. I can see that this is a kind of a cool pattern. And I'm pretty sure, have, you tr have anyone done this before? Yeah. We kind of do this, we just didn't know that it was called a bridge. But I must admit, I very often take this way further. Because basically, we've talked about composition over inheritance in software programming for a while now. And it's kind of this. We keep moving things apart and all, so we're not just doing two levels anymore. We're passing in and composing our objects in a way different way. So this might not be as important today as it was previously. 
And if we look at the comparison between the different, different patterns, so what we've got, we've got the adapter, which wraps an implementation of something, but it changes the interface and keeps the functionality the same, right? Decorator wraps an implementation of something. It uses the same interface as the thing that it wraps, but it adds functionality. So they are different, even though they look from code very similar. The facade doesn't wrap anything. It basically creates a brand new interface for you to use. But the functionality behind that interface is going to be something that's already there. So we're not changing the functionality. We're just cutting down the API or changing the interface that we want to use without wrapping it. Proxy, new implementation, so it doesn't wrap anything. Some form of, it uses the same interface as the other thing that you're calling. It's just that you're calling it locally and that's being called over there. Um, and the function, it doesn't change the functionality. And the bridge is kind of hard to put into this thing because it's kind of a two layer abstraction thingy. So it, it partly wraps, some of the functionality is wrapped and some of it is implemented by the same thing. Um, it can use an existing interface. Um, and adding or removing functionality kind of depends on what you're doing with it. So let's have a look at some code. And I love the person who put up a uh, podium for Smurfs. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have a look at, uh, so this is the source code that I, as I said, it's on, it's on uh, GitHub. Um, so I'm just going to have a, a quick look at how this looks. So we'll start with the uh, adapter. And I have a very, very simple implementation here. Writing everything in one class seemed like a really good idea when I had a lot of screen real estate. When you go to font size 25, that comes really small. So basically, I've got my logger, my iLogger implementation here. It takes a log level and a message. Log level is just a, a, an enum. And then I have a, uh, an iLogger implementation called log for net logger. So basically, it wraps log for the log for net logger, creates the interface that I need and translates all, each one of these calls to that interface to calls that correspond to what Log4Net expects. So that's that after. Um, if we have a look at the next one, which is Decorator, we have the, um, actually the same sample as I showed you before. Don't look at what I'm actually doing in the main here. I have really stupid code, but I want to show you the patterns, not the code. So it's all about is it Friday service and logger, logger stuff. So I've got an I is it Friday service. We all need one of those in our projects. Then I have an implementation of I is it Friday service, which you called is it Friday service, which basically returns whether or not it's Friday. And then I have a caching version of the is it Friday service, because obviously the call to th this, this call here is so heavy that we need to cache the result, right? Can't keep running that over and over. So what the caching thing does, it basically takes an implementation of I is it Friday service and the, the cache configuration that it needs. And whenever we call and implement I is it Friday service, and whenever it's being implement, uh, called, the interface is being called is it Friday, it basically looks at, can I do something else? Do I have a cached value? No, I don't. Then I use the internal version. Otherwise, I return the cached value. So I added caching to my I is it Friday service. And then I have a login version of it as well. So basically, every time this thing takes an I is it Friday service, whenever it's being called, it calls the service, but it also lo logs out the, the call so I can see what's going on. So decorators are kind of nice. It's a nice way of basically adding functionality without doing composition and without doing inheritance. <coughs> we have the facade. In this case, the facade is basically a, it does a logging facade here, and it Sorry, I've got the logger up here, iLogger. And then I have an iLogging facade, uh, a logging facade here that basically takes the logger and goes and, sorry, I need to go down here so you can see the, the logger here. So the implementation that I have is the console logger here. And the console logger takes in a type and a console caller and a format and a log level and a bunch of different things here and the message and writes that out to the foreground, or to the, the console. So my facade here, to make it simpler for the user to use this thing, I've created a facade called iLogger, which has a simple log method. 
And what that does, it basically makes it very, very simple to call log, pass in a level and a message, and then this thing, the facade, takes away all the pain of having to figure out the type and the color and all the other things that's needed by the system behind. Not that I'm saying that that's a complicated backend, but it's, it's kind of facading it at least. And finally, I have a proxy here, which is, once again, an, an Is It Friday service. And Uh, nah. Okay, so in this case, I, sorry, while well, since I wrote this specific one, um, this thing isn't actually calling anything uh, off in somewhere else. Uh, it's just creating an instance for me, so it basically creates a, a proxy for an object that's in memory because I didn't want to go ahead and build a, a web service and all of that stuff. But what it does, it, it basically goes ahead and checks some username information and then calls the instance as though it's local. So you could imagine this thing actually calling off to a web service. It was just too much work to write that. Having that said, your proxy object doesn't necessarily have to be remote. The definition of a proxy object is, or proxy is actually just talking to an object, which could be something simple as what I'm doing here with just creating an instance of it. It doesn't necessarily need to be somewhere else. It could be a proxy to an object that is too complicated to create, so it kind of becomes a singleton uh, through the proxy. So very, I'm, code wise, I'm going through them quite fast, I know, but you've got all the code to play around with. And I do believe that most of them, you can actually go in and press F5 and it runs, which is not what my code normally does. Yes? Uh, you the bridge. Oh, did I miss the bridge? Yes, I did. Thank you for that. Bridge, to show off the bridge. I wrote, let's kill the main here because I don't want to show that. So, once again, I've got a logger. But I've taken my iLogger, which has a log method, and I've broken it into a, a logger and a log writer. So I've got one part that does the logging and one part that actually writes it out to the console, or to whatever I want, sorry, not, not the console specifically. And then I've created the impl implementation here. So the implementation here is a simple logger. The simple logger takes an iLog writer and creates a very simple log entry for me, thus simple, log write, simple logger. The advanced one is a bit more complicated because it writes advanced ahead of it and also writes out some time and a few little other things. So it, it basically adds a bit more to the logging statement. But once again, depends on the log writer to do the actual work. It just formats it. And then I have a configurable thing here where not only does it take a log writer, but it also takes a format that I can use to basically create my own log system or log entries. And, but all of these are dependent on an implementation of log writer, I log writer. So I have a console log writer and a log for net log writer. So I can basically combine these. So today I want to have the advanced logger with, with log for net, and I can combine those. So during development, maybe I do a lot of logging, but I want to have more information. So I might do a configurable logger with some extra information and just a console logger for my local machine. So we can combine these. That's the bridge. Thank you for reminding me of that. Did all of this make sort of sense? Cool. So, visitor pattern. This is cool, but really hard to explain why it's cool. It's just one of these, you read about it and you start playing with it and you sort of, this, this light bulb lights up and you go, oh, that is smart. That is really smart. And then you think it's really cool and then one morning you're in the shower and you're going, why is that really smart? I'm sort of questioning this pattern. It looks really cool, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm coming into there are other ways of doing that today, but I thought I'd show it. So this, the visitor pattern is a way of separating algorithm from an object structure which, is oper which it operates. So you need to add new algorithms to an object without modifying them. So you might need to say that you have a shape, which happens to be my example, and you need to have a way of calculating the area of that shape. OK, cool. I'll add a get area method. Oh, by the way, it would be kind of cool if we're rendering this on screen that you could also tell me x and y coordinates, or you have an x and y and you want to be able to figure out where is position on the screen, so I need another algorithm for that. And oh, it would be kind of cool if we also somehow could build a way of saying I have multiple shapes. Please tell me the size of the area I need to create to be able to render all of these shapes and they still fit in and things like that. All of these are new sort of things that come along the way. So often we go back and we change our objects. We add new functionality to them to support these new calculations. 
The visitor pattern basically says, no, you shouldn't go and change your object. I'll give you a generic way of adding new features to your object without having to change the object. So the way that they do it is item A and item B both expose a, a method called accept. It's a generally named accept. It's just a method on each one of these items that takes in a visitor, thus the visitor pattern. The visitor, in turn, has a method called visit element, which is basically takes an instance of either item A or item B. They don't need to implement the same interface. They, they, it's just that the visitor needs to have a visit element method that takes in either an item A or an item B. So you can have many, many overloads of the visit element function. So you can do different things for different elements. And what happens is that the client creates a visitor, and then it tells the item A in this case that, can you please accept this visitor? Item A goes, yep, I can accept that visitor. So it calls visit element on the visitor, passing itself into the visitor. And then the visitor can go and do stuff and calculate things and do things to item A. And then you, we can use the visitor to figure out what it came up with. And then I can go and take the same visitor and pass it into item B's visit element. And item B passes itself into the visitor that then comes back and uses the item B to do whatever it needs to do. This makes no sense at all, right? OK. Little caveat here. As we're passing, if we go back here, as it's passing visit element this, the visitor can only use public things on item B. So you cannot go in and do private things and make changes to private things, but you can use all of the public API. So this makes more sense if I show you. And it is down here. This whole thing of having it in alphabetical order is complicated. So I have created. Um, let's. I have created a couple of shapes. I've created a square and a circle and a text object. These are basically things we could render on a screen. They all, in this case, happen to implement I am visitable. You don't need to do that. It just needs to have a method, in this case, called accept that accepts an I visitor. And the implementation of accept is literally visitor visit this. So it basically injects itself back into the visitor. The I visitor pattern, if we go up here, the I visitor pattern is visit, square, circle, and text. So it has four, three different methods, each for one type, each type. So it means that when you need more things that can be visited by this visitor, you need to add another function which is kind of cool because it doesn't break uh, open close principle because you're just adding new things to it. And implementation here, I have an area calculation visitor. And if we look at square here, it has the algorithm to figure out the area for a square, area for a circle, and area for a text, which in which case it uses some font size and some made up values. Um, and this is where you realize that I'm almost 40 years old, and I'm happy that my dad is a math teacher because I could not figure out how to do an area calculation of a circle. Does that kind of explain how much I suck at math? Um, I learned that over the Christmas. I have a drawing area calculation visitor. So what this does, so yeah, so one thing also, it's the, the uh, visitor never returns a value. It's always void, but it can expose the result using a property. So the area calculation visitor just goes and calculates for one thing. The drawing area calculation visitor actually goes ahead and adds uh, to the drawing area to figure out what rectangle do I need to be able to draw this thing. And if you call that passing in three different squares and four different uh, circles and maybe a, a text area, it will basically figure out how much space do I need to render all these things. Things that I didn't know when I created the, uh, the square and the circle and the text. And then I have a scale by, which actually modifies the object. So I can go and say, I want you to scale by 
1.2, so basically make it 20% bigger, I can pass in a square and it will make sure that the square becomes 1.2 uh, or 20% bigger area-wise. Same thing with circle, it figures out, there's actually math in here as well, that figures out how to scale your area to, to the circle to make it bigger in 20% 20, 20 bigger area. And then in my method up here, we can see how it basically calculate area, for example, basically goes, creates an area calculation visitor, takes the visitor, visitable object, passes in the area, and then on my area, I can figure, or my, on my visitor, I can figure out the area. And I can also go and say, here, uh, that one, calculate total drawing area. It takes a, an I enumerable of I am visitable, creates a drawing area calculated visitor, goes through each one of the visitables, passing in the visitor, the visitor just goes ahead and adds and adds and adds, and at the end here, I can go and figure out this is the rectangle that I need to be able to draw all of these uh, shapes. It's kind of a cool way of doing it, and, but as I said, I, I go back and forth between why didn't I just do a, uh, why don't you just create an instance of it and pass it in without having to do the whole passing back and forth? Why have, why take an object and pass in a visitor and then have the thing called the visitor versus just taking the visitor object and passing the freaking thing straight in? But there are some, some architectural interesting ideas that means that you don't cause problems with open close principle and some other things with the visitor pattern. So the visitor pattern is interesting. I do suggest that you have a look at it. Uh, I am uh, almost 99% sure that you will probably never use it. But it's kind of cool. Circuit breaker. That's a new one. Has anybody heard of the circuit breaker pattern? Ooh. Okay. That was, okay. There's that's a lot of people. Uh, so the circuit breaker, breaker pattern is, is something that we use with microservices in a lot of cases. So it's used to detect failures and encapsulates the logic of preventing a failure from constantly recurring. So what we do here, in, for example, in a microservice or architecture where we're dependent on calling other systems all the time, and we're doing it probably in a cloud environment, and cloud, if, you, if you're building cloud, you know that you always have to take into account that stuff might not be available, right? Stuff goes up and down, and it's being moved around, and there might be temporary outages, and if you're working with a database, for example, um, Azure, which I've, I know more than AWS, I know that in Azure, for example, if you talk to SQL, SQL's responsibility in Azure is to pr protect itself. So if you start hammering your database, SQL Server will actually start returning er errors going saying, I'm not, I'm not doing that because my main priority is to survive. If you try to kill me by overloading me, I'm gonna stop <coughs> responding. So we need to take into account that we have what is called transient failures in the cloud in a lot of cases, and that's where the circuit breaker comes in. So the first problem we're trying to solve are just that, transient failures. So you're dependent on other services, but they might be in a state where they're potentially failing, or they're really, really slow. But the problem is that when you, for example, call a web service that is failing, you might have a timeout. So you might be waiting for that thing to respond for maybe 20 seconds. If you have a heavy load system and you keep sending requests to that, and each one of those requests have to wait 20 seconds, your system is gonna get really slow. Bad problem. And it's, it's basically, once again, it has to be a transient fault because what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you don't have to wait for 20 seconds all the time, but you don't wanna go and say that thing is broken, we have to redeploy the system or we need to solve it because it might be a transient thing that disappears. And the second problem is that that thing that is having the problems it might be stuck on something else. And it's trying to survive and it's trying to get over its own problem. It's trying to heal from something else. But at the same time, you're hammering it with requests continuously, using up a bunch of its resources. So while it's trying to survive of a failure somewhere else potentially, you're adding more load to it, basically crushing the service. So you might end up with a cascading failure situation. So what you've got with the circuit breaker is that you wrap that logic so you take a thing, you take your request, and you wrap it into a piece, an object, and then that object basically keeps track of failing requests. And then you can have a trip on it, so basically saying, once you've done this call, and it has failed for more than five times in a row, I want you to kill it. So whenever somebody tries to make that request again, just throw an exception straight off. Don't wait 20 seconds, don't make the request, don't load the other server, just kill it. Just whenever somebody calls it, just kill it because it's offline, and then maybe after 20 seconds or after a set amount of time, it might say, I'm gonna let one call through. 
and then it basically throws for everything else, but lets one call through. If that call succeeds, it will then go and say, I might load up some more calls and let some more traffic go through. And then once the thing comes back online in full power, it will basically just back off and say, you can now do your calls as you wish. So the logic of being able to do back offs and basically canceling things like that goes into your circuit breaker. So if we look at the circuit breaker here, I have a very simple implementation of it. Um, so the circuit breaker here is basically an HTTP circuit breaker. What it does, it has a max failure and a retry count. And when you do call uh, execute on it with the, the thing that is a generic thing that I built, so it uses a, a callback function. So basically it, it, it's a, it takes a func that returns a task of HTTP response message. And it basically wraps that and checks to see, is the current state of the circuit breaker open? Basically, it's, it's turned off. Then add failure count and return null. Basically, just go and say, don't, don't make the call because it's now broken. Otherwise, make the request. And then it makes the request, and it basically puts in a try catch. If it fails, it adds a failure count to it. And then we could have things like, uh, so failure count here has logic to say that if the current state is open and failure count blah, 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 and recount our account, it could have a trying to close thing. So basically, it lets something through, lets one thing through and then nothing else. Um, and it can be open and closed. So you call this thing. I, I wouldn't use this code. It's just a sample. But what you do here is you go request helper dot make request. And it takes a circuit breaker and a, a client, and it makes the call for me. And the circuit breaker is being passed in. It's a generic thing that I can have. I can have more of those for different calls, for example. But the idea is keeping track of failed calls, for example, and basically be able to short circuit the whole thing and say, I, you have failed now, so for a while now, I'm not going to let you go ahead and do that anymore. You can also do that not just for failures. You could go and have a circuit breaker that says, if these calls start, take, start taking more than X amount of time, we might want to back off and not let all of them through and, and let the, other, the service that we're calling heal up. So circuit breaker is kind of cool. Uh, it's one of those things that you can do in a fairly generic way if you know what you're doing. Um, and it can help you out quite a lot when it comes to depending on a bunch of other services. Make sense? Cool. And then we have the one that everybody uses and nobody knows how to use, the repository pattern. How many of you have not implemented a repository at some point? You are lucky, because that means I can't yell at you. The repository pattern is very, very common. We use that all over the place. Everybody goes, we need a, a repo. It needs to be a repository. We need, OK. A repository abstracts away the data layer and centralizes the retrieval of domain objects. That's me. It wasn't on Wikipedia. I couldn't find repository pattern on Wikipedia with a nice definition, so I wrote my own. And it basically, it's just a layer on top of your um, data access that uh, gives you a way of getting domain objects. So the problem that you have is you need to get domain objects, because domain objects are persistent ignorant in a, in a domain-driven development environment. They're, they are there, but persistence is a different thing, right? So we create a repo or a repository, uh, and it gives us the ability to go and say, can I get a user with this ID? And it, it hides all of the database logic, and it goes and gets me a, a fully working user object that I can use in my domain model. Sweet. Very, very simple. Demo. Um, that is a very, very short presentation. I'm going to tell you why it doesn't work. Um, repository. I have a very simple sample here. I, I use uh, Entity Framework. Uh, and my repo down here is I use a repository implemented by use repository. And I actually love this syntax here. Uh, I want to talk, thank a guy called Jimmy Nilsson in Sweden for that. Um, he made me change the way that I write my repos. So these method names are quite odd, right? Normally you have where user is admin or where, um, or sorry, um, by ID or admins or whatever. But adding methods like this called who are admins and that have been deleted, whose first name starts with, look kind of odd like here. But if you go up here and read it, it's very readable. Var users in users whose first name starts with C. Makes it a bit read more readable than get by ID, get by admin, get by blah, blah, blah. Anyhow. This is all it does. It has a, a user's context in this case, which is a, an entity framework thing. It has the implementation here. 
I do not, and you should not. Here are a couple of things that I dislike about people doing with repositories. One, I don't like people who expose iQueryable. The idea behind a repo is to hide database access and make sure that people get objects based on defined queries. It's supposed to hide the query logic of how to get your object. If you start exposing iQueryable here, then you're spreading that logic of how to find an object throughout your entire system. So the data access logic is spread out throughout the system. And then somebody comes and says, let's add soft deletes to this. So you're never supposed to get something that has this, the deleted flag equals true. Oh, crap. You have to go around and rewrite all of your access logic because it's spread out across your application because you have an iQueryable. They should be predefined methods giving you specific things hiding query logic. Next thing here, you can see that I have an add and a delete method. What is missing? A save method. The repository should not be responsible for saving things. The repository is there to retrieve objects, not save them. There should be other logic that figures out that once you've retrieved the object, if you change that object and you call save on something, it should be saved. So if you're using Entity Framework here, for example, Entity Framework's context will internally keep track of that object. So the context will know whether or not an object needs to be saved. So the context has the ability to save and save objects from many different repositories in the same transaction. If you add a save method to your repository, that is dangerous when it comes to Entity Framework. Because if you add a save method to the user repository, and you call save, and you go user context.save, you're actually saving every changed object in that context, not just users. So you're not saving stuff from the user repository. You're saving objects from any kind of repository that has ever retrieved anything from that context in that process. So don't add a save. Save is something else, because you might be reading stuff from different repos, so you need to make sure that changes from objects in different repositories should be saved in one single transaction. No saves. But Chris, how the hell are we going to do saves then? I will show you. So, saves do not go into your repository. It's for retrieval. Which is why unit of work comes up. Unit of work is according to Martin Fowler, maintains a list of objects affected by a business transaction and coordinates the writing of changes and the resolution of concurrency problems. That sounds like saving stuff. So what we do is that we basically have something that keeps track of all of our modified entities and makes it possible for us to persist it as one atomic thing, like a transaction. So if you have uh, Entity Framework, for example, their context is a unit of work. You create a context, you get stuff out of the context, you modify objects on that context, and you call save on that context, and the context is your unit of work, because once you call save on the context, it will save all changed objects in that context. However, you do not want to go ahead and spread your, your entity framework contexts around and have them spread out, because you hide them in the repository. So how do we go about hiding the context while still use, and using, by re, using repositories, but not exposing a save method in the rep, uh, repository. Well, I have a very, very simple demo of that. There are other ways of doing this, but imagine, I do think I, no, actually I don't have an entity framework version, sorry about that. What I've got is an in-memory store in this case, but what we do is we, well, actually this does what you could have done. So the interface I, I support unit of work has a complete method. My implementation, which is my repository in this case, it's just in memory, implements I support unit of work, but it implements it explicitly. So if I use this thing as an in memory store, I'm not gonna see the complete method. I need to cast it to that interface to actually get access to it. And then I have my unit of work, which takes a I support unit of work item and calls complete on it when you complete the unit of work. So I could go ahead and register multiple I support unit of work in this unit of, this unit of work class. And then what you do is up here, 
I create a unit of work, I go ahead and make some changes to it, and then I call unit of work complete to basically do the save, and then the unit of work is the thing that basically wraps everything up and, and makes sure it's being persisted. I would recommend that you, you do something like this and figure out a way to handle this if you're doing repositories. And I also recommend that your unit of work thing implements iDisposable so that you can basically, basically wrap it in a using statement, for example, and roll back stuff that you don't want to have. So within the using statement, unless you call complete on it, it rolls back stuff. If you don't have that, then entity framework, you might, after your unit of work, there are actually changes left in memory that shouldn't be there, for example. So unit work is where your save method should be, and it should not be part of your repository. And that's where I'm saying a lot of people are doing it, in quotes, wrong, because they expose iQueryable, spreading out query logic throughout the application, and they have a save method on each one of the um, repositories, which means that you're actually potentially saving way more than you're supposed to. <coughs> yes? Uh, but here you are limiting all those patterns you showed in the, showed in the beginning. They're kind of generic patterns. Right. But here you are kind of limiting this repository pattern, limiting to C sharp uh, entity framework. No, so yes and no. No, you could. I, in this case, I'm limiting it to uh, entity framework because entity framework happens to be, have an implementation of unit of work in, in already. It influences the pattern itself, uh, kind of. What you, you, you mentioned that you can't do save. So it uh, kind of influences the, the, the pattern, pattern I itself, but yeah. Yeah, so you don't want to do, yeah, so that's the thing. The pattern repository shouldn't have a save method. So I'm not, it, they're all a part of different things. So basically each pattern is its own thing for its own specific problem where the repository, or the, the repository pattern is retrieval of objects. You could go and say that your unit of work was your repository as well if you wanted to, but it kind of, in that case, you should know that your unit of work is your repository, and where, where having a unit of work as a defined thing, you, you know that a unit of work is this. The problem with repositories that don't do unit of work is if you go and save, your, as I said, your entity framework context or your and hibernate context or your other thing, you might actually be saving things that you didn't intend to save because you don't really know what the unit of work is, for example. If you do entity framework, for example, or you do any form of uh, ORMs in ASP.NET Core and you put it into your, your IOC container and you leave it in the IOC container for the entire request, you might be doing things in the IOC container or in the, uh, the repository, sorry, in the context, your unit of work, in different areas. And then at the end of it, you save and you don't actually know what you're saving. But yes, it, it is, it, some things do limit other things. Um, and then I've got factories, another one of my favorites. Uh, I'm going to do this very, very fast. Uh, so an, a factory is an object for creating other objects. Uh, or basically, it returns an object or a subclass of that object. Uh, the problem that you have is that you don't want to use new. If you start newing up objects in your, your code, you are coupling your class to that other class. So by using a factory, you can go and get an instance of that type, but you don't tie yourself to a specific implementation. So new is really not a great keyword. Demo for that, actually, sorry, I'm a little bit short. There is code in there. It's basically just factory functions. You call get a new object. Here are the parameters I need, like basically like a constructor. But you do it on a different object that then returns not a specific instance, but something that implements either that instance or a subclass or an interface or whatever. But basically, it allows you to vary the objects that you're getting back. It also allows you to get away from the fact that if you have constructor parameters, you have multiple constructors for a method, and they overlap in the type of types, you can't have two constructor parameters that, that take string, for example, or two constructors that both just take a string as a parameter. Using a factory, you can actually have multiple constructors that just take a string, and then it com basically configures the object for you before it's being returned back. And my final pattern, which is really not that big, it's just I love this and people miss it, null object. A null object is an object with no referenced value or with defined neutral or null behavior. So it's about having null checks all over the place. I hate, hate having the if blah, blah, blah equals null, then do this, otherwise do that, or rather often you end up writing this, right? If log is not equal to null, write out this. But you end up having these, 
if log not equals to null all over your code because you, you don't know if it's null, so you don't want to call it, and C Sharp doesn't have, handle null very well. It would be kind of nice if we just wrote that, right? So what we do is we create a null logger which implements the ilog interface, but it doesn't do anything. It's just an empty class. It, does, it has empty methods. It just doesn't do anything. And whenever you have a logger, instead of setting it to null, you pass in a null logger. So you can call it, but it doesn't actually do anything. So that you get rid of all these if statements. Or for this, for example, you call users.admins to get all of your admins, and then you do if admins not equals to null. Oh, so if I didn't find any admins, I get a null back. But if I did find admins, I get an, an array. Why not just return an array all the time, but return a, an empty array? So I don't have to do the check for if admins equals null. I can go and check. I always get an object back. Whether or not there's anything in the array, that's a whole different story. But you get away from all of these null checks by having what is like an object, but it's still an, an empty object. It doesn't exist. But you don't have to check for it. Demo for that is also really stupid. It's basically, I'm doing this. I'm just making sure that it returns objects for you. Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm right at time. That's why I didn't do the, the code. Uh, you've got all of my code uh, down here at that address. There is more stuff in there. I wrote some other things with object pools and some other patterns that I thought were really cool that you can have a look at. Uh, other than that, thank you so much for listening. Uh, don't forget to do the evals. If you like the session, do a green note. If you didn't like the session, come up and tell me why. I'll make it better and then explain why it was awesome. And then you do a green on the way out afterwards. <laughs> Are we agree?